Okay. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Giorgio Tortone from the University of Bologna. The title of his talk is The Nodal Set of Solutions to Fractional Elliptic Equations. Please. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. So today I would like to talk, uh, well, somehow to talk about uh, two parts that we already seen in the previous talk of Susanna. So I will discuss few results obtained with Susanna and with uh, Yannick Sira about uh, the nodal set solution to some fractional elliptic equation. So this, uh, this problem, as we already seen, is a, it's a very simple problem to be defined. So the nodal set, uh, it means just to study the set where the function takes value zero. And it is, a, it is a very classical problem. So it has been start, uh, studied initially by Karlman, studying the problem of unique continuation principle. But after that, many authors contribute to this kind of uh, problem. So here I mentioned just few results that are actually the one that Susanna showed us before. So Caffarelli, Donnelly, and Pfefferman for the eigenvalue value problem, Friedman, Garofalo, and, and so on. And uh, the main question in this kind of problem is to understand uh, what is the local behavior of the function near the nodal set and to understand uh, what is the structure of the nodal set itself, focusing the attention of the singular part, which is usually the more tricky part. So uh, usually in this kind of result, uh, you can see result about a divergence from operator involving uh, um, some elliptic coefficient so we decided to try to answer these two questions that I mentioned here. So in our work, we decided to understand, uh, for example, what happens if you slightly remove the assumption of ellipticity? So what happens if, for example, you suppose uh, that your function can be either zero plus, with your coefficient can be either zero plus infinity on some subset of Rn? And uh, also how the presence of this degeneracy can affect the geometry of the nodal set. And on the other hand, uh, exploiting this uh, relation between some degenerate operator and the fraction Laplacian, we were actually able to understand how the non-local uh, attitude of the fraction Laplacian can change the geometry and the local behavior of the function near the zero set. Mm -hmm. So I will uh, just show a few results about the second question. I will not enter into detail, but uh, just explain what are the difference between the local case and the fractional Laplacian, and also try to mention what are the difference between this, uh, let's say, harmonic case and the uh, one described by Susanna involving segregation uh, problem. So, for me, classic. Well, for me, uh, the classical contribution are uh, the one related to this kind of problem. So when you look to the literature, usually you can find solution. In the easiest case, you can uh, find result about solution of this kind of equation, so homogeneous equation. So if you take like a solution of a divergence form equation and the coefficients are elliptic and Lipschitz, you can actually say that the nodal set splits in two parts. So in one part, uh, if you have a regularity, so you have that the gra you suppose that the RU is the set where the gradient is different from zero. And you call it actually a regular part since it is regular by implicit function theorem. And the other part, which is the singular one, where the gradient is actually equal to zero. So you decided to study the possible configuration of the function near the zero set, and then to understand better what is the structure of this singular part. So these are the common questions. So you can actually prove the following result. So you can prove that uh, it also unique continuation principle. So if you, you are taking a function which solves an equation on some, let's say some box, so it can be identically zero on some uh, uh, open subset, uh, if and only if it is identically zero in the whole box. And uh, after proving this result, you can prove that it has a finite integer, uh, finite integer vanishing order. So the vanishing order is a number which is greater or equal than one, an integer. Then I just put this uh, result uh, as a curiosity for uh, this Lipschitz assumption. You can actually prove that the Lipschitz continuity is a necessary condition to have a unique continuation. So this was proved by many counterexamples by these authors uh, where they show that uh, without Lipschitz continuity, 
you can actually have some configuration where do not hold the unique continuation mode. So this is just uh, the motivation for the leak continuity. Okay, so after that, what can you say about singular set? So the singular set, uh, Lin proved that uh, for a more general class of equation, but he proved that the singular set is small in the sense that uh, the Hausdorff dimension is less or equal than n minus two. So the regular part is an n minus one dimensional set and the singular is uh, less or equal than n minus two. Uh, it has dimension less or equal than n minus two. And a few years later, Han tried to understand what is the structure of the singular set. And he proved that actually you can find a collection of strata, so Sj, for J between zero and n minus two. And you can prove that uh, it can be decomposed as the union of this uh, Sj. And this Sj, they can be very, uh, very irregular, but at least each Sj can be, con it's contained in a countable union of J dimensional graph. And uh, it proves that uh, for J between zero and for small J, the graph is Lipschitz and uh, for uh, J equal N minus two, so the biggest uh, stratum of the singular set, uh, this object is contained in a nice uh, domain in the sense uh, C one half uh, graphs. So this is the classical picture and we decide to understand what happened for the fractional Laplacian. So the fractional Laplacian, I just put here the definition. Uh, yeah, you can call it also as Laplacian is uh, the prototype of, uh, well, the easiest uh, case of integral differential operator and a local operator. So this is the formulation as an integral differential operator. And for those of you that are not familiar with the fractional Laplacian, as Susanna said, and here I think it's easier to see by looking to this definition, it's a non-local operator in the sense that in order to understand the value of the fractional Laplacian at one point x, you need to know uh, what is the behavior of the function in the whole Rn, since uh, the value is computed by computing this integral. And so it is non-local because if you perturb the function very far from x, the fractional Laplacian uh, is still affected by that perturbation, even if it is uh, very far from the point uh, where you are evaluating the fractional Laplacian. So this is a very rough uh, way to describe the non-locality of this operator. So by looking to this operator, we decided to understand, okay, what happens if you take a function well-defined in the whole Rn such that in some ball, it satisfies fractional Laplacian of u equal to zero. What can you say about the nodal set? So unfortunately, as uh, Susanna said, uh, there are some problems for the non-local operator, like the likeness uh, up to now of uh, monotonicity formula by using all, only this definition of the fraction of Laplacian. So a common technique uh, is to use uh, the so-called extension uh, of uh, Caffarelli and Sylvester. So I will not enter in the details. I just write here what is uh, this, uh, what is the idea behind this extension? So the idea is that uh, instead of uh, considering the fractional Laplacian in Rn, you can consider a new operator, a new problem defined in Rn plus one. So you have to add one new variable, let's call it y. And, uh, oops, and uh, you have a relation between these two problems. So you have that uh, the fractional Laplacian can be seen as a Dirichlet to Neumann map for this new operator. So more precisely, you have that uh, if u is your initial function in Rn, you construct a new function g, and there is this relation between the two, the two semi-norm in the sense that this is a Gallardo semi-norm in Rn related to the fraction of Laplacian. And this is a, a Dirichlet type uh, semi-norm with this weight, where a is a number expressed in function with, of s, so a is one minus two s. And so what you have, you have that uh, if you start with some u, you can construct this new function g. And this new function g, it solves uh, this equation. So this divergence form equation in Rn plus one. And you can translate uh, the condition of the fractional Laplacian with this Neumann condition. So I don't want to describe uh, the detail about this formula. Just, I just want to say that uh, a key ingredient uh, for this analysis is to localize the operator. So the fractional Laplacian is this particular feature that it has a local realization by adding one variable and paying, let's say paying this price that here you have to consider an operator which is the uh, lead 
one and one, this coefficient can be either degenerate or singular on the set where y is equal to zero. So this is the reason. So actually, in uh, so actually in our paper, uh, we decided to start. We studied this kind of operator, and then uh, by imposing the Neumann condition, we apply this result on the case of a harmonic function. But uh, for the sake of simplicity, I decided to avoid that part. I just wanted to mention why this operator is uh, is kind of tricky because, uh, as you can see here by this weight, uh, if a is uh, positive, uh, the weight uh, y with exponent a is equal to zero on the set sigma. Instead, when a is negative, this coefficient blows up on this set sigma. So sigma is the core of the generous and singularity. And so we try to understand how the presence of this uh, manifold affected the whole theory of uh, nodal set and the geometry of the nodal set. But uh, besides this, uh, if you look just to the problem of S-Laplacian, this is the up to now the only way to try in order to understand the, the local picture of your solution and the local picture of the nodal set itself. So what can you prove? Okay, so first by using this trick, you can prove the validity of the unique continuation principle. Actually, from my point of view, this is the, uh, maybe one could hope to prove some other result using some, uh, technique that have been used, for example, for the obstacle problem. But I think that uh, the unique continuation principle is the point where you, well, at up to now, there are no other way to prove uh, this, uh, the validity of this principle without uh, the extension technique. So here you deeply use the technique, the extension uh, formulation. But by using this formulation, you can prove strong validity of strong unique principle for the fractional Laplace, as the fallen Feli did. And also for a more general fractional operator, like a fractional power of divergence form operator, like uh, the results uh, made by Hui Yu. And uh, in the end, you can actually prove these uh, nice results that says that uh, you, can, uh, you can see the presence of the local attitude also at the level of the strong unique continuation principle. In the sense that uh, you can actually prove that uh, if you're taking a function which is as harmonic on some disconnected domain. So if this function is zero in some open subset of one of this component, then immediately the function is zero everywhere. So in all these components, not just in the chosen one. So this, this can, for example, this can be proved only by using the extension because using the extension, you can see uh, the connection between these components and without that, uh, it's not possible to prove even the simplest, uh, strong, unique continuation principle. So by this result, you can actually move and study the, the local property of your function. And so you can prove that uh, your function behaves similarly, at least at the point of the vanishing order, in the sense that, uh, as in the local case, in the sense that the vanishing order is a, a finite number, which is greater or equal than one, an integer, an integer. Then you can uh, prove uh, that uh, your function satisfy a Taylor expansion near the nodal, nodal set. So U of X can be written as uh, a polynomial plus a lower order term where K is the vanishing order. But here you have another difference. So while in the classical case, you have that uh, somehow locally, your function is described by harmonic polynomial in this case, locally, phi of x0 can be any possible polynomial. So it can be an harmonic polynomial, but also a generic other polynomial. And the fact that you can actually have any possible configuration near another set will affect the singular part, as we will see. So you can actually prove by using this classification that uh, for every S, the regular part can be defined again as the set where the gradient is different from zero. And so by applying implicit function theorem, you can prove that this set R of U is actually a regular hypersurface. Then for the singular part, you can define it as well as the, grade, the set of points where the gradient is equal to zero. But here you can only prove that the Hausdorff dimension is less or equal than N minus one. So actually you can prove that uh, 
the, the size, the, the, the singular set is uh, as big as the regular part. So it can be as big as the regular part. And this is something completely new in uh, this kind of uh, example. So since we arrived at this problem, uh, we decided to understand better where it comes from this n minus one. So we decided to understand uh, the structure of the singular set. And so we actually proved these results that, uh, let's say that roughly speaking, it says that uh, the singular set is composed by two parts. So the first part is actually the set of points where uh, your function resembles the same behavior as in the local case. So this set uh, capital S star J are the set of points where locally your function behaves like an harmonic polynomial. And so since you resemble the, the previous picture, you have that the maximum dimension is n minus two. But then you have this second part, which is somehow purely non-local in the sense that here, you have that uh, the biggest uh, stratum is the n minus is j equal n minus one, and here the function resemble can resemble any possible polynomial. So here you have that the function behaves like any generic polynomial, and in the, you have that yeah as before all these sets are contained in j dimensional manifold. So initially one could think that uh, this is due to some technicality. So the fact that uh, you have n minus one comes from some technical details, but actually we can prove that this is optimal in the sense that uh, this is not due to the fact that we are using the extension technique, but you can actually uh, construct some function that are as harmonic on some set. And they have uh, the nodal set, uh, and they have that the nodal set coincides with the biggest stratum of the singular set. So everywhere it is singular. And the, sing and the singular set is as is big and as in the sense that it is n minus one dimensional. So this is just uh, an example that we computed, but you can compute several examples also in other dimension. So what you can actually do is to construct explicitly some uh, s-harmonic function. So this is a picture of a s-harmonic function between minus one and one. G is the data outside of uh, the domain. So this function is, is uh, S-harmonic uh, inside of this domain. And here it has a uh, vanishing order equal to two. So the idea is that if you, for example, you extend it constantly in another variable, you will obtain in the 2D case, a function which, is, which has as nodal set a line. And on that line, the vanishing order is equal to zero and the gradient is equal to zero. So it's singular everywhere. There is singularity in all the nodal set. And this is something uh, completely new. So I just, to, so I want to finish just with two slides, uh, just uh, comparing this result with the one that Susanna described before. So Susanna talked about uh, segregation problem, which is a very nice uh, topic. And uh, actually here I wrote uh, another prototype uh, of uh, uh, the free boundary problem for the fraction Laplacian. So the idea is that uh, uh, the picture that you can find when you look to one phase non-local problem or a multi-phase non-local problem as the segregated one is different from the one that you obtain in the harmonic case. Indeed, in this case, I just wrote uh, uh, another problem, which is the one phase problem. So here, usually for the classic case, you have the Dirichlet semi norm, here I put the Gallardo semi norm. And what you can prove, you can prove that in this case, the function behaves near the nodal set, which here is near the free boundary, as the distance from the free boundary with exponent s, which is actually the same behavior that you can uh, uh, find in the regular part of the segregated configuration that uh, in the case of the fraction Laplacian. So in that case, you have like an more than one configuration, you have two, conf you have two uh, functions. So both function behaves like the distance from the free boundary with exponent s. So here I just wrote from, for the sake of completeness, the earlier Lagrange equation satisfied by, by the function near the free boundary, but they are satisfied in a very weak sense. So they must be understood as a viscosity, in a viscosity formulation. So I don't want to enter into the detail, but uh, just, by summarizing all the results, 
you have that in the non-local case, there are many differences in the sense that uh, if you look to non-local multi-phase or one-phase problem and the S harmonic function, you have that uh, in the case of segregation in one phase, uh, the function behaves like the distance uh, to a fractional exponent and the singular set is small. Instead, if you look to harmonic function, you have that at least your function behaves like a linear object and the singular set can be as big as the whole nodal set. So this is the first uh, difference and somehow is related to what Susanna said before. I just wanted to mention that uh, the difference, it is also on the behavior of the function itself near the free boundary. And uh, finally, this last picture is uh, about the difference between local operator and fractional power of the operator. So if you, in the case of local operator, you have the singular set uh, is small as in the first picture. So here you have the singular set is just uh, one point and the behavior can be classified by all the classification of harmonic polynomials. Instead, in the fractional case, you can have a, a singular set, which is big in the sense that here it is a line. And so in the singular set, in the, in, sorry, in the fractional case, you can have both cases and the structure is more somehow interesting for that reason. And this is all due to the non-local aspect of the operator. So with this, I will finish my talk and uh, thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, there are some questions. Or remarks. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, this is very, this is a very nice result. Uh, I only would like to ask uh, about the definition in, um, there is one of the part of the vanishing set. Uh, I think it's one, the one you called singular, mm. where the, the gradient is zero. Yeah. Do you include in this part uh, any point, uh, if there is any, uh, when the function is singular, so there is no gradient at all? Well, actually, in this case, for a fractional, uh, for a fractional Laplacian, I can prove that inside the, the function are actually smooth. So I, I know that in this case, uh, it is well-defined the gradient. Uh, so I split in these two, in this dichotomy. So on one side, if it is different from zero, and then if it is uh, equal to zero. Okay, because you are excluding the boundary of the domain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just studying interior uh, structure of the nodal set, non boundary regularity. Yeah. So even when, when you have a function that behaves like uh, um, fractional power of the distance from uh, some vanishing set, yeah. that is that, it does not arrive vertically to the, to the free boundary. Uh, no, okay, so that example that you said is a function which is uh, no which is uh, S harmonic in the positivity set. So where it is uh, positive. So that's a boundary. Yeah. So, so those are boundary points. Okay, sorry, I, I was missing this detail. No, 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 yeah, yeah, no, no, but it's true. In, in this sense, uh, well, let's say that uh, in the local case, uh, somehow the interior behavior some, somehow resembles the boundary behavior in the sense that you expect in both cases uh, linear. Exactly. exactly. In this case, as uh, I show here in this picture, the first picture somehow is like the boundary case. So you have that uh, this object is uh, S harmonic uh, where it is positive, and then you impose this boundary condition. The yeah. case that we studied I is thought, just- I thought that also in the red part of the domain, the equation was-, uh, was no, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Other questions? I think, uh, I think not. Okay. Uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Terracini and Professor Tortone for, for your interesting uh, seminars.